if you are not familiar with the ministry of Pacific Garden Mission, and I know some of you are, many of you are perhaps, um, but you need to be aware of this mission. 140 years old, and when an organization has been around for 140 years, there's something called mission drift, where the mission of whatever organization changes over those 40 years. We see that a lot in Christian colleges, actually, where they started out orthodox and they move away from that. Pacific Garden Mission, and you'll hear a little bit more about it in a few minutes, uh, has not experienced that mission drift. If it has, I haven't seen it, I haven't heard of it, because they're relentlessly focused on the gospel. And uh, that's very encouraging to me to see that. Also, uh, another way that you might be familiar with this is they have a radio program called Unshackled. And it's also a podcast, so I would encourage you to listen to that podcast. It tells the stories of uh, everyday men and women and their conversion to Christ. And, but I caution you, I warn you, you listen to it in the car at your own risk. Because if you're driving, you start bawling and then you don't want to screech off the road or something. So just a caveat to that. But we have uh, right now uh, the president of Pacific Garden Mission, a longtime friend of mine, Philip Kwiatkowski. Why don't you welcome him by saying, praise the Lord. Well, good morning. It is indeed a, uh, it's a privilege to be here this morning. And a little bit before I talk about the mission, uh, share my own story. I am from Chicago, uh, raised a Catholic from the south side of Chicago, went to Brother Rice High School. And uh, I, I know I won't give any specific names, Doug, <laughs> but I was working at a blood bank in Tinley Park. Uh, I was about 20 years old, and I was surrounded by people of faith. Uh, Doug Horn was working there. Marion Schultz was working there. Another uh, phlebotomist, that's what I was, by the name of Cosette Davis, was working there. And uh, I remember Doug was the first person ever to witness to me. No one ever shared the gospel with me. I remember Doug talked about Jesus. Uh, there was this nurse there, Cosette, as uh, we would talk about spiritual things. One day we were at a blood drive. And it got real slow, so she began to talk about the rapture. I'm Catholic. I never heard about a rapture and all this stuff. And she began to tell me things that I'd never heard before. And she, uh, she said, why don't you come out to my church one day? Now, she was, she was a black lady. She said, don't worry, you'll feel uh, comfortable. It's a mixed congregation and whatnot. So I said, all right, so I'll just go. So it was May 13th, 1984. And what she didn't tell me was I was the one that made it mixed for the day. <laughs> now, understand, as a Catholic boy, this is my first venture inside a non-Catholic church. Never been in one before. I walk in there, there's, there's moving and swaying and music, and this was different. And then I remember she said, come, sit near the front. I don't want to sit in the front. I want to sit in the back. And so, you know, I kind of sit up there, and I remember I sit there, and this guy gets up. His name is Bishop Lee. Who do we have any visitors here? Tell us the name in your church, where you're from. Like, oh, I'm not doing this thing. Are you kidding me? I'm sitting up front. So I, as she elbows me, I stand up. I'm Phil Kwiatkowski from St. Catharines, and I sit back down. But when he got up, he began to preach the gospel, how you can be born again. And I remember one phrase he said at the end. He said, why don't you do your mother the greatest favor you can this Mother's Day? And that's by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. Well, as uh, the service ended, he gave a simple invitation to come to faith, and uh, I wasn't going to come. I got here on the second row, did the name church thing and all that, and uh, she elbows me. So well, why don't you go forward? I got this far. So, so big and bold, I said, well, why don't you go with me? She says, okay. So we make our way towards the island. She sits back down, so I'm kind of left hung out to dry. <laughs> but I walked down the aisle that day and I did. I bowed my head and I prayed to receive Christ, but something happened in my life. So something, something amazing happened. And I remember I began to read and uh, again, we had Christians at work. I remember I'd pick up Marion Schultz for work. She lived on Ridgeland. And uh, again, they knew me before. I would pick her up and I began to ask Bible questions. She said, Phil, what happened to you? What happened? I said, well, I, you know, I got saved. And then she invited me to the church where Doug and uh, Marion were going. And uh, your father, I think, was the chairman of the board at the time. 
in uh, Pastor Sheridan. He began to disciple me, and uh, God just began a wonderful work. So that was in 1984. In 1986, uh, I went to Moody. That's where Doug went. The first time I ever heard of Moody was from Doug. And I went to Moody in 1986, where I, I met my wife. Now, my wife, uh, we, went from a mission, we went on a mission trip to Florida. I can say this about my wife. She, uh, her, she's uh, from French Canada. So her parents do not speak English, and I do not speak French. I have the greatest in-law relationship any man <laughs> could ever ask for. We met, uh, and it was, it was one of those things where you would never advise your children to do. Because I met her in March of 87 and married her in December of 87. Kind of quick. And my kids always joke with me. I tell my kids, you have to make sure you graduate school. Nobody gets married. You did, Dad. Well, that's me. You don't do that. <laughs> and I came down to Pacific Garden of Mission in 1988. And wow, when I saw what that ministry did, uh, as a Moody student, I was still a Moody student, praying for God's direction for my life. When I saw what that place did, I was absolutely amazed. Uh, many times and when missionaries, people go around the world looking for people, people are walking through our doors asking, kind of like the Philippian jailer, what must I do? They're looking for life's answers. So I've been down there since 1988. A couple winters ago, we saw as many as 1,200 people a night. I mean, you think about that, those numbers are, are stunning. 1,200 people a night seeking shelter. The key to Pacific Garden Mission is not the food, the shelter, the clothing which we do provide. As Doug said, it's the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is first and foremost because I believe if you give somebody food, clothes, they can go to hell with a nice suit and a nice meal, but what they need is Jesus Christ. And that is life transformative. It's the gospel message. So our residents are required before they receive a meal, you have to sit and listen to a gospel message. We have a discipleship program where men and women who profess faith in Christ can come and join a year-long Bible program uh, for a discipleship. We have a drug program, biblically based, where if you're coming with an addiction, you can join our 90-day Bible program. But I want you to continue to pray for Pacific Garden Mission. It is a spiritual battle. When I see these men and women daily coming through our doors, seeking help, we could do nothing but call upon Almighty God to assist us in this great endeavor. So pray for Pacific Art of Mission. It is a, it's a privilege just to be here today with you and to open up the Word of God. So before we get into the Word, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we bow down before you tonight, thanking you once again for your grace. Father, I pray as we look at your Word that you would speak to our hearts that you would receive the glory for all that is done. We point to you, thanking you for your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I want to look at a segment of David's life from the scripture here. I remember hearing a story about a man there in an, in an old theater and that night there was a man who was a famous uh, operatic singer and the crowd was gathered to hear him sing the 23rd Psalm. Well, he got up there and he sang and his, his diction was perfect. Every word he said just flowed as he just sang the 23rd Psalm absolutely perfect. Well, when he was finished... The crowd just rose up in universal applause. They were just amazed at this man, this wonderful singer that can sing this song, this psalm in such a beautiful way. In the audience that day, there was an old pastor, a man of God, a faithful individual. People knew who he was, so they asked this man to get up and recite the 23rd psalm. Well, he got up and he recited it, and his diction was not perfect. Speech was not eloquent. He stumbled over some of the words and really wasn't like the other guy. And he, when he was finished, there wasn't universal applause. When you'd look around the audience, there wasn't a dry eye. Somebody asked that operatic singer, they said, what's the difference when, when you sing, they, they applaud, when he recites, they cry? He looked down and said, here's the difference. I know the psalm. That man knows the shepherd. 
And there is a huge difference from knowing the Scripture between knowing the God who wrote the Scripture. When I look at David's life here, and I believe what God is preparing him for, as a young man, David was anointed king by Samuel. The future looked wonderful, but there's a process that David went through that I believe every person of God goes through, and it's the process whereby God reveals himself and makes himself known to you. And many times it's through heartache and pain. I, I, I look at a slice of, of Joseph's life, how as a young man he dreamed of greatness, but he spent years incarcerated in an Egyptian prison. But God knew exactly what he was doing. At this point in David's life, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, things are going well. He's serving Saul. He's over the men of war. Look, if you would, to verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. Things are going well. David is over the men of war. The future seemed bright. As a young man, he was anointed king by Samuel. And now as he grows, he's a little older, and now he's over Saul's men of war. He's victorious. Universal accolades. People are singing his praises. Verse 6. Came to pass as they, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the woman came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, with instruments of music. And the woman answered one another as they played and says, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. I mean, they're, they're singing of him in the city streets. Now Saul grows jealous at this here. And it says here in verse 9, And Saul I David from that day forward. Saul's jealousy begins, verse 10 came to pass on the morrow that an evil spirit from God came upon Saul as he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at the other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. I mean, we just read these scriptures. But imagine this. You show up for work and your boss hurls a sword at you. Not real good for employee relations. I mean, there's David, he's just playing the harp and the king just throws, hey, what, what had, tries to kill him. And not only that, now he's demoted. Verse 12, and Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore, Saul removed him from him and made him captain over a thousand. So, so you go from being over the men of war to being a captain of a thousand. Anything ever happened in your life that you had no control over the events and things just got worse? And you begin to question, God, where are you? Are you in control? Obviously, the answer is yes. Here's David for, for no fault of his own. If things transpire because we did things that are wrong, we can somehow justify and understand. David didn't do it. He was doing what he ought to be doing. And now all of a sudden his boss, the king, tries to kill him. Now he loses his position, but it gets much worse than that. So again, Saul tries to kill uh, David. Look, look, look down, if you would, in, in chapter uh, 19, chapter 19, verse 10. And Saul uh, sought to smite David even to the wall with a javelin. This is the second time, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David fled and escaped that night. Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, For if thou save not thy life uh, tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went and fled and escaped. Again, as I read through this narrative, I just imagine what's going through Saul's mind might not be different what would be going on through many of our minds. At one moment, everything seems to be going well. 
your, your career is progressing. Things are happening. The future is bright. And suddenly, out of nowhere, everything takes a turn. All of a sudden, somebody tries to kill you. You are demoted. And now only are you not demoted. You are forced to flee. You, you, you go to your wife seeking some answers and it doesn't work. And now you have to escape through a window like a common criminal. And now you're on the run. You, you're, you're looking for some answers. You're looking for a refuge. You're looking for something to make sense of all this. You ever been there, Christian? Sometimes in our families, in our personal lives, where we ask these questions, God, what is going on? How did my marriage come to this? What happened with my children? What is going on? And we look for answers and we seek to go everywhere and sometimes it doesn't seem like there is any. Well, David's on the run. Look, if you would, to verse 18 of chapter 19, verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah. David, not knowing where to go, he goes to his wife. That doesn't work out. And now he goes to his preacher, goes to Samuel, the, the man who anointed him king. And I'm sure David had many questions. Well, what is transpiring? What, what is going on? And so he goes to Samuel and that doesn't work out. And he has to flee. Look, if you would, to chapter 20. And David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came and said before Jonathan, what have I done? What is my iniquity? Isn't that the questions that we have many times when things happen? What did, what did I do to cause what's happening? And David, now it didn't work out at Samuel, and he goes to his best friend, Jonathan, and he's seeking answers. What, what, what did I do? What, what's my iniquity? What have I done wrong? What's my sin before thy father? He seeks my life. I, I, I don't know what's happening. Well, he was with Jonathan for a little bit there, and again, that doesn't work out. Look, if you would, to verse 42 of chapter 20. Verse 42 of chapter 20. And Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for as much as we have both sworn, both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord be between me and thee, and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. David is still on the run. Flees from Saul, goes to his wife, goes out the window, goes to Samuel. That doesn't work. Goes to Jonathan. That doesn't work. David is just on the run. He is not certain. Look over you to chapter 21 and verse 10. It says here, and David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Again, we just read those words, but that is stunning. The city of Goliath. Now he's in exile in a, in a different nation. Of all the places for David to flee to, Nothing is working in his own nation. Nothing is working in his family with this preacher, with this friend. He is going everywhere looking for answers. And now he goes to Achish, king of Gath. They didn't like him there. Verse 12, and David laid up these words in his heart, and he was so afraid of Achish, king of Gath. Changed his behavior before them and feigned himself mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down upon his beard. He acted like a crazy man. I mean, just imagine the picture here. The, the, the one time glorious uh, leader of the armies of Israel as he walked down the streets, saw his sleigh and his thousands, David his ten thousands. He walked down there and people cheered his name. Now he's reduced as an exile to this episode in his life where spittle is falling down upon his beard and he's acting like a madman? Man, how did, it, how did it come to this? So David escapes from this man and look, if you would, to chapter 22 and verse 1. David escaped therefore thence and escaped to the cave, Aldulam. Now David is homeless, 
in a cave. Man, that's tough. The, the one time, son-in-law to the king of the nation, where they sang his praises. The future looked bright. Imagine him sitting there in a cave, the thoughts that he would have had. David went everywhere, went to his wife, went to his preacher, went to his friend. He did everything that he could do. And this is what he is reduced to. Well, what was David thinking? What was going on? Turn, if you would, to Psalm 142. I want you to see what David was thinking here. Psalm 142. This psalm was written during this time. If you read the inscription at the beginning of the psalm, Psalm 142, it says in Michel, a Michelle of David, a prayer when he was in the what? Cave. So this is when David wrote this. I cried unto thee, O Lord, with my voice, with my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. And that's real prayer. He's just, God, this is what's going on. Can you imagine he's bringing his complaint before God? I was doing my job, oh Lord. I was doing everything I was supposed to do and this guy tried to kill me. I'm estranged from my wife. I, I went to Samuel and I went to Jonathan and I even went to Achish and nothing is working and now I'm in this cave all by myself and you can hear the sobs echoing off the wall. This is loneliness and there he is he's, and he's showing his complaint before God. I've tried everything. I've gone everywhere. I've talked to everybody. Look at this here. He goes on. It says in the Psalm, verse 3, When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, they have privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand, and behold, there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. I believe verse 4 is just a pity party. I'm looking for refuge. I, 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 no man cared me. I went to Jonathan and I went to Samuel and I went to Achish. I'm looking for some answer. I'm looking for some type of refuge and everybody is failing me. But there's a lesson here that God wants David to learn. If we are going to go forward, look at the next verse. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, thou art my, what? Refuge. I was looking for a refuge everywhere else, but it came to the point where I was reduced to absolutely nothing for me to realize, you are my refuge. My answer isn't in my wife, and it's not in Jonathan, and it's not in Samuel. You know, Christian, for some of us, and, and let, let, let me be honest, for many of us, some of our greatest struggles and heartaches are in our own families. Uh, you know, I have four children, and uh, my one child, and, and Doug, Doug met Michael, he wanted to say hi, and uh, Michael was that child for every family, you always have one, he was my one. And you talk about a kid that reduces you and your wife to tears. That was my boy. All the other kids were fine and everything was well. This kid, from the time he was young, I, first when he was young, I would defend him. Then I realized he was wrong as he got kicked out of school. Got kicked. My wife is a teacher at a Christian school. He got kicked out of Christian school. Then I brought him over to a, a Christian a summer camp and a place where he could stay after he got caught stealing somewhere. And then when they got to know him, they didn't want him at the school. And then I had, uh, no, I didn't know what to do with him. Was, uh, so we, he ended up going to our public school, which was a bad decision, met a bad crowd. Oh, I could tell you stories. Like David just cried, what do I do, God? I'm trying to go to this school, trying to talk to this person. Maybe I'll send him over here, send him over there. It was finally reduced where me and my wife just cried out to God. God intervened in the life of this boy. Intervene in the life of this boy. God, do something because there's nothing I can do. I, I was pastoring and I would, he'd go to church. He would sit up there. He had to make him go. He didn't want to be there. 
went to the youth group and while pastoring, got kicked out of one of the things because the youth pastor came and had to kick out the pastor's son. He deserved it. Oh, Lord, I would just cry. Oh, what do I do? Tried everything like David. I, what's the answer? Should I send him here? Should we run here? So we were reduced. And, and I prayed. And listen to me. This is what I prayed. And he had all these, these godless friends. I couldn't stand. Uh, godless friends. And I'd say, Lord, don't let my boy get away with anything. Don't let him get away with anything. Those kids that he's hanging with, they can get away with it because their parents are not praying for him. I am praying for him. Don't let him get away with with nothing. I would pray and I would pray and I would pray. And oh, things always went bad for him. Oh, and uh, he just about he, uh, two years ago, he busted his arm, which is still doesn't have full use of it. Didn't wake him up. Something happened. It was a year ago where it was a bad trip or something. He was reduced. He had, he had Crohn's disease. He had his intestine ripped out. Still didn't do nothing. He had this horrible trip and something happened where he was just, just gone mentally. And then he began to cry out to God. My wife just read Psalms every night to him, read the Psalms, read the Psalms. And he finally got actually really honestly, truly born again. Some, you know, when some people get saved, some get, he was saved. He woke up and when you see him, it's all Bible now. And I remember we're sitting at the kitchen table one day and he said to me, Dad, he said, I'm looking at my life. And I, and I wondered and I didn't tell him my prayer. He said, Dad, I, I was saying all these other kids, they do all this stuff and nothing ever happens to them. Why does it always happen to me? I said, hallelujah, amen. Because <laughs> you have a daddy that prays. And now that he's saved, Lord, you know, Let's, you know, reverse that. Amen. Help him. But and, and I looked at that and I tried running here and running there and going there. It reduced me to the point of absolute tear. And those of you that are parents know exactly what I'm talking about, because there is nothing that'll break you like your own child. And I cried out to God, me and my wife. There's nothing I could do. God was my refuge. God was my portion. God was our strength. Hallelujah. And I believe that's what David could say over here. Look at this here in verse 5. I cried unto thee. He just cried out. I said, O oh Lord, thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. I am admitting the strength of the adversary or the enemy. Bring my soul out of prison. He, he viewed his situation as being incarcerated. But I want you to understand this. God was working. God allowed this for a purpose. I often believe that David, who was Israel's greatest king, was the greatest king because of what he went through. Solomon was never the man that David was. Solomon never went through this. And many times it's through these struggles and difficulties where we really begin to know the shepherd. And you see, what many of us do is we look to change our circumstance and God necessarily does not want to change our circumstance. He wants to change our perspective. David didn't need a better cave. David didn't need a bigger promotion. David needed to get to know who God really was. What I find fascinating about this, look if you would to Psalm 57. And I really believe the order of this was when this was penned. It's probably 142 first and then Psalm 57. Because when you look at Psalm 57... To the chief musician, Altachith, and Misham of David, when he fled from Saul in a what again? In the cave. Again, this time frame here. But, but look at the, the differences in the language from Psalm 142. Psalm 142 was almost I, my complaint. Lord, I, I looked on my right hand, but nobody was there. Nobody cared for my soul. I couldn't find refuge. Woe is me. Everything is terrible. Wah, wah, wah. You look at Psalm 57. 
Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, under the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, Selah. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions. I lie even among them that are set on fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit for me in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves, Selah. My heart is fixed. O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up my glory, awake psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O God, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above the earth. Wow! How did we get from one Psalm 142? Nobody's on my right hand. Nobody loves me. There's nobody that's a refuge for me. I'm pouring a mark complaint. Wah, wah, wah. Was Psalm 57, be thou exalted. Praise the Lord. I will praise you. He's still in a cave. He's still there. His circumstance didn't change. But his perspective did. And maybe for some this morning, I want to challenge you. If you think what I need is a, a, a better job. What I need is a different situation. And, and I believe that's one of the biggest problems in the church. I believe scripturally marriage is permanent. You make a vow, that's your vow. But many times you think, well, if I have a different spouse, things will be different. It won't be different because you bring yourself along into the marriage, right? Oh, if I have a different this, a um, bigger house, a newer car, oh, things, are, no, they won't. What I need is not a different circumstance. I need to have a different perspective where I am at. One thing I've always loved about the story of Joseph, he never let his circumstances dictate the person he was. Remember he was incarcerated and he was talking to the, the butler and the baker. and He noticed that they were downcast and he asked about their well-being. I always find that amazing. You're in jail. Do you think you really care about a butler and a baker? I'm down here in jail for something I didn't do. You want to talk about woes? I got them. You think I really care if you look down today? But he cared. Everywhere Joseph went, he always excelled. Whether it was being sold into slavery in Potiphar's house, whether it was in jail, not knowing how long he would be there, circumstance didn't matter. My perspective. David, it doesn't really matter whether I'm being chased by Saul, being let down through a window, having to run from Samuel, from Jonathan, from Achish, and now I'm in a cave and here I am. It really doesn't matter. I've looked for a refuge everywhere else. I've tried to change my circumstance, but it's not my circumstance. It's not Samuel. It's not Achish. It's not my wife. It's not Jonathan. It's you. God, it's you. When you go to work tomorrow and you may have a boss you don't like, it's not a new boss that you need. God, it's you. Please, God, change my perspective on my life around me. Things won't get better if I get better circumstances because I am going to go with me. Not a circumstance, but a perspective. Also, many times what we look is horizontal, but God wants us to look Upward, God wants us to look vertical. We, we, we look at our situation around us and we try to dictate and we try to make plans and, and our moods and everything else. I don't, need to look, I don't need to look around me horizontally. God, what are you doing in the midst of this? God, you're sovereign. What, what, what are you doing in the midst of my marriage? What are you doing in the midst of my family? What are you doing in the midst of my job or my ministry or wherever I'm at? I want to look at it from a God perspective because there is a God in heaven and he is my refuge. Look back again quickly to 1 Samuel chapter 22. And what I like about this, 1 Samuel chapter 22, because it is almost 
humorous to a point when you look at verse 1, 1 Samuel chapter 22. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave of Dulam. David was in a cave. But listen to this. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard of it, they went down thither to him. Now they were afraid that Saul would probably get reprisal and possibly kill David's family. So now David's family comes to the cave. But look at verse 2. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented, and every uh, gathered themselves unto him. That doesn't sound like the greatest group of people. The last thing, if I'm having a pity party, that I want is a bunch of guys who can't pay their bills complaining, man, my creditor's after me. You too, yeah. Bunch of discontented people, angry. I can't stand stall either. He's no good, yeah. A bunch of discontented, debt-ridden, no good people that are in distress and they're telling you your woes. You ever been in a situation where I want to tell my woes and everybody else is telling their woes? I don't want to hear yours. I got mine. Please. That's where, if I'm David, I'm thinking, I, I got this cave first. Could you guys please find another one? Please, could you go somewhere else? Could, but he doesn't do that. It says in the, in the next section there, he became a captain over them. What he did, instead of running somewhere else, he was on the run the whole time. Left Saul, went to his wife, left his wife, went to Samuel, left Samuel, went to Jonathan, left Jonathan, went to Achis, went to the cave. All these debt-ridden, discontented, angry people, they gathered together under the cave. I'm going to stop running. I'm going to be a captain over these men. What he did is he bloomed where he was planted. Christians, sometimes, no matter where we are at, we have to bloom where we are planted. God, this is my lot in life. This is who I'm with. This is where I'm at. By complaining about it won't change anything. But by running to other situations or circumstances, don't do anything. You are my refuge. I have to look at my perspective. I have to look at it from a vertical perspective, God, that you are doing something in the midst of my life to train me, to shape me. And I need to bloom right where I am at. I remember once I was hearing an illustration. It was about, of all things, it was about bees. They, they say when little bees are in the honeycomb, you know, they put the, uh, the wax over that the little bee coming out of the larva has to eat its way through this wax. And it seems to be a very arduous process. They eat their way through the wax. So a group of scientists decided to eliminate the wax and see what would happen. Well, all these little larvae, when they came time to mature, Instead of flying away, they all fell to the ground and died. And then they realized it was because of the arduous process of eating through the wax. The wax scraped away the membranes of these little larvae and exposed the wings so they can fly away. It's not by eliminating tribulation and trial and discomfort. Sometimes God wants us to get through that tribulation, trial, and discomfort because it exposes our wings and we can be the creature that God designed us to be. Instead of praying that the wax be removed, change my perspective. Help me look at it vertically and say, God, what are you doing? Help me bloom where I'm planted and accept this situation and become the man or woman that you want me to be. As I close, one of the songs of the faith that we have always loved as a church was written by Horatio Spatford, and many of you know the story. In the city of Chicago, this man's business was wiped out by the Chicago fire. Him and his wife and children were at a loss, didn't know what to do. So he decided to go back to England and kind of regroup and see what to do. So he had to stay behind in Chicago and he sent his wife and children on ahead. Well, in the middle of the Atlantic, the boat that was carrying his wife and child collided with another boat and sank. He gets a 
telegram back here in the States from his wife that simply says saved and saved alone. Think about this, your, your business is wiped out. Your children now that you loved and cherished are, are dead, they've drowned. Well, the story goes that he, was, he got on a boat and he was going to meet his wife back in England. And it's on the very spot that his children drowned that he penned these words. And, and, and we know the words, but I want you to think about the setting. Imagine, possibly it was a beautiful evening. The steward comes and he knocks on the door of Mr. Spatford and said, Mr. Spatford, this is approximately the area that carried your beloved children to their watery grave. He walks on the deck of the ship, looks out at the water. What would he say? Would he shake his fists at heaven? Would he complain about his circumstance? Would he bemoan his lot in life? They say it's on that very spot that he wrote these words that we sing. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. And he closed with these words. O oh Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. If that man, after losing his livelihood and his children, can say, even so, it is well. That's a man who didn't let his circumstances dictate his life. He had the right perspective. That's a man who didn't look at life horizontally, but vertically because it was a God thing. And that's a man who decided to bloom where he was planted. David, look at your lot in life. David, look at your situation. Everything is gone. You're on the run. The king wants to kill you. You're estranged from your wife. You're in exile from your own country. You're living in a cave with all these people. David, what are you going to do? I will praise and extol him. Hallelujah. That's what I'm going to do. What a story and what a faith. My friend, where are you this morning? For some of us, it isn't a, it, it isn't a circumstance. It's a perspective. It's a God perspective. We need to bloom where we are planted and ask God, please set my heart aright so I can say along with the hymn writer, even so, oh yes, though Satan should buffet, Trials are going to come even so. It is well. It is well with my soul. Let's all pray together if we would, please. Father, as we bow before you tonight or this morning, we give you glory. I look at this example from the life of David, and Lord, I, for many of us, we identify. Lord, it's hard. We look at the, the trials of our own life and our own difficulties, and it is tough. But Lord, like David, help us really to learn, God, you are our refuge. You are our portion, and that we indeed can extol and praise your name. We give you the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.